So a common setup of AI models is to take all of the aggregated biomarker data from the genome, from omics data, imaging, and even real-time data to make a decision. It might be prognosis or uh, diagnosis of a patient. It might be likely treatment response. And the reason to do this is both to make the decision or assist making the decision and to discover biomarkers uh, in the data on the left that might be particularly valuable for making these uh, predictions. So in a lot of these models, uh, we are contributing harmonized and derived data back to NIAGADS uh, and using some of these measures to make predictions. So I'll tell you a little bit about projects applying AI to images uh, for dementia classification and subtyping, and then also to whole genome data uh, to discover markers that influence risk for AD and future decline, and also that are relevant for drug repositioning. So just to recap, uh, deep learning, and in particular convolutional neural networks, are a sophisticated mathematical approach to distill predictors uh, from large data sets of data to help make a decision. So in this biometric authentication system that, that is designed to admit a certain person, um, higher and higher order features are distilled from the image uh, so that you can tell who it is. And in an imaging context, the decisions that are being made are what is the person's diagnosis? Do they have different pathologies, tau, uh, vascular disease, and so forth? Are they amyloid positive? And we'll talk about methods uh, designed particularly to do that. So we just published on October 13th, one of the largest brain imaging studies ever uh, that used deep learning to identify whether a person had Alzheimer's disease on the basis of a raw MRI scan. So this method uh, learned uh, from data, in fact, from 50,000 people from 217 scanners, and it was pre-trained to classify whether a person was female or male and then fine-tuned to make the decision about Alzheimer's disease, which it made in independent data with 91% accuracy. Now, we've been studying in great detail what it is about deep learning methods that make them able to detect disease. So in this benchmarking effort, a wide range of different deep learning uh, workflows were applied. And their accuracy in detecting Alzheimer's disease in independent data, data they've not seen, is shown here. And the accuracy goes as high as 91%. And on the x-axis, you see the amount of training data, the amount of data that was used to train the models. And obviously, this varies also uh, by method. What we're also learning, and this is a recent paper by Nikhil Dinagar in, in our group, is that uh, the performance, although excellent uh, for detecting Alzheimer's disease, 91%, uh, this is massive improvements uh, based on, on old-fashioned machine learning using hand-picked uh, features. The performance can drop a little bit when this is applied to data that's coming from different scanners and different populations. So we'll talk about uh, how to make sure methods work uh, more universally. Another issue with deep learning is interpretability. So a lot of the work uh, on these convolutional neural networks has also allowed them to report the features in the images that are being used to make a prediction, a diagnosis, or, or an inference. This is really remarkable work by Taiho Zhou and Andy Saken in Indiana, in which they have identified in PET scans, uh, tau PET scans, signatures that are particularly useful for predicting AD diagnosis. And these uh, are consistent with our knowledge of the BRAC stages of tau pathology, but also provide a very objective biomarker uh, for, for uh, disease in this case. Other methods focus on dementia subtyping. So there's much work in the field. Uh, this is not by our group, it's by, by another group, uh, dividing the trajectory of tau pathology into subtypes and stages. Uh, and one of the ways that we're taking this one step further, and this is work by Jun Hao Wen and Christos Davatsikos at University of Pennsylvania, is to make a score for the subtypes of, of, of atrophy and degeneration that are found in images for each person. And then if each subtype is scored, you have an exceptionally precise definition of the processes that are going on that then can be subjected to genome-wide association to find drivers of the different processes. So this is a tremendous work which has found four different dimensions of progression uh, from MCI to AD and then gone ahead and searched the genome and in fact found uh, really promising markers in the genome that influence uh, the emergence of these different subtypes. Another parallel line of work uh, has used more conventional genome-wide screening of brain-derived measures. So we lead and have led for over a decade um, genome-wide association studies of brain measures. Uh, one recent innovation was uh, longitudinal GWAS. So it was to take all of the people we could find uh, with uh, repeat MRI scans and from that compute the rates of uh, tissue loss in different parts of the brain. 
And then from that, identify markers that influence, uh, genomic markers that influence the rate of tissue loss in, in the hippocampus, the amygdala, a whole range of structures. And this unearthed, as well as well-known genes, such as APOE, the, the major uh, risk gene for, for late onset ED, many other genes that can become interesting targets to uh, investigate their role uh, in different AD-dependent processes. We can now explain about 4 to 5 percent of the variance in all of these key biomarkers, the, the hippocampal volume in particular. We've also been examining overlap between these markers, uh, 20 hits in the hippocampus, with Brian Kunkel and the ADSP's uh, GWAS of Alzheimer's disease. Most of these genes uh, are age dependent in their effect. So you'll see that in the imaging, having uh, in this case 60 worldwide cohorts examined for influence of APOE4 uh, genotype on hippocampal volume, you'll see a progressively increasing effect uh, as age progresses. Uh, so this is lending a lot of insight into how APOE, the major risk gene uh, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, exerts its effect and when. Another use of, of, of deep learning is, is image harmonization. So I mentioned that uh, for these deep learning methods to work, there has to be some degree of agreement uh, between the scanners and sources of data. And this is work by Vishnu Bashyam and, and uh, Christos Davatsikos developing a so-called uh, cycle GAN to alter the image contrast from different cohorts so that it matches a reference. They have found that using the scan method to adjust the intensity distributions of the scans uh, improves the multi-site predictive performance of the algorithms that they're developing. Now, just to prove that this uh, is actually beneficial, uh, Sobi Sinha in our group at, at USC has found that making deep learning corrections to harmonize MRI scans actually improves the ability to classify uh, different uh, uh, things from scans, Alzheimer's diagnosis in particular, but presumably also amyloid and prognosis as well. Just to say how these work, um, cycle GANs are a very recently developed method uh, for so-called neural style transfer. They can take the content of an image, even a painting, and transfer it to produce a high quality photo uh, of the same scene and vice versa. And this has been adapted using uh, radiologic scans to make scans look like they were collected on a different scanner or even a better uh, scanner. So this work by Nada Jahanshad's group, uh, Meng Ting Lu, who is a postdoc in her group, has applied this to great effect uh, with MRI to essentially make scans that uh, are matched to a reference, uh, in this case, ADNI, even though, were, though they were collected from diverse uh, scanners and, and, and centers worldwide. And again, this uh, cycle consistent generative adversarial network uh, is making sure that the content of the image is unchanged and the quantitative metrics uh, remain stable where the contrast of the, of the image is made uh, um, identical to the reference uh, scan. Now, a rather remarkable extension of this, this is work uh, with Yan Jin and, and colleagues at Biogen, is to synthesize types of scans that we didn't collect. So many of you know that MRI is cheaper and more widely available and somewhat less invasive than amyloid PET scans, although most of the major uh, drug developments in Alzheimer's disease target amyloid. So obviously an MRI-based estimate of amyloid burden could allow massive screening of hundreds of thousands of scans for risk factors, uh, including the genome for risk factors that promote the accumulation of amyloid. So this uh, remarkable work has used a cycle GAN to fuse T1 weighted and flare imaging uh, collected in an MRI scanner and prove that in reality, the synthetic PET scans, which were not collected, uh, are almost identical to those that had been collected. This is, is checked with uh, data where they were also collected, uh, giving you um, derived estimates of amyloid burden uh, in AD and normal controls. Here you see the real and synthetic data being compared. Another remarkable use of AI is for um, inferring pathology, which would not be known with in vivo imaging, um, based on training uh, machine learning models here were in work by Dugu Tosun and her group at UCSF uh, to do um, neuropathologic subtyping uh, based on the ROSMAP uh, data set where both autopsy and in vivo imaging data are available. Now, this really works remarkably well for detecting TDP43, Lewy bodies, and, and uh, cerebral am amyloid angiopathy, which are not immediately evident on MRI or PET. But this may uh, help to identify uh, subgroups of responders in drug trials, or even identify risk factors in the genome environment by better defining the biology. Now, let's move on to the genome. So the second half of the talk has to do with AI for genomic data uh, and for combining genomic and imaging data. This work by uh, Quang Sik No, uh, working with Taiho Zhou and Andy Saken in Indiana, adapts the convolutional neural network model to sequences. So all of you know that you could divide the whole genome into fragments, uh, read them in much like the patches in an image into an aggregate deep learning method uh, that tries to predict Alzheimer's disease from the multiple 
variants that are observed in, in the genome. So this both discovers uh, genes that are relevant and also lends predictive models, uh, both in this case of AD and also of the intermediate phenotypes uh, that we've talked about before. Now, to facilitate this, a very major effort led by Sarah and Sasha Zoranek at, at, at uh, Curie has divided um, 14,000 of the ADSP genomes into tiles. And so these are short genomic sequences that then can be uh, conveniently read into machine learning and deep learning methods to discover new genes and variants that contribute to risk uh, for AD or protection against it. These tiles are being uh, developed, used, and returned to, to NIAGADS for, for other folks to use. And they've actually uh, been creating a, a wonderful API, a program interface, where new students and researchers could use this data conveniently uh, in conjunction with uh, traditional uh, machine learning models like LASSO and support vector machines uh, to predict Alzheimer's disease from whole genome sequences. So this has uh, been uh, um, made in conjunction with some video tutorials to show how to use it. Uh, just to illustrate it, this is nice work by Jinghuan Bao and Brian Lee uh, in Li Shen's lab at, at, at UPenn, uh, where they, they published two abstracts at this year's um, uh, AAIC, uh, illustrating how you would use machine learning on whole genomic tiles uh, to both classify Alzheimer's disease and discover uh, new variants. You'll see that there are now over a thousand SNP sets that would not have been recovered using conventional uh, univariate uh, genome screening that are now being followed up for replication uh, in, in incoming uh, ADSP uh, genomic data. Another uh, area of interest, and this is one of the aims of AI for AD, is to predict future clinical decline uh, from a combination of gene expression uh, information uh, and genetic risk loci. So Kyunga Chern also, in working with Christos Tavatsikos, has been asking the question whether there are module-based polygenic risk scores, uh, or MBPRS, um, where they, the genomic hits in the ADGWAS are partitioned based on their expression in certain cell types uh, or certain pathways, whether it be amyloid or tau or, or inflammatory or microglial pathways. Now, it's turned out that the most predictive module-based polygenic risk scores uh, for future decline can be ranked. And so here, here's a sort of example of cell-based uh, polygenic risk, where they screened uh, the ROSMAP uh, database, where the, there's a single-cell RNA-seq uh, data available, replicated the uh, genomic expression modules in uh, the Southwest Dementia Brain Bank, which was uh, developed in Bristol uh, in, the, in the UK. And from this, they've subsetted the genomic risk markers in, 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 in the genome into categories uh, where they're expressed in specific uh, types of cell and also specific gene ontology pathways. And they've been confirming whether or not these genomic uh, clusters uh, correspond in some degree to the imaging uh, clusters, uh, and they do. So just to look at this in, in, in more detail, they found a very aggressive polygenic risk score, um, people that have a high risk uh, on the score show precipitous clinical decline, both in ADNI uh, and in the Framingham Heart Study, uh, showing that this is a really uh, strong predictor uh, in a Cox proportional hazard model of future decline. And this module in particular, it's called the M16 uh, module-based polygenic risk uh, score, uh, is particularly enriched in pathways uh, to do with uh, glutamatergic neurotransmission, uh, dopamine release, and, and cyclic AMP uh, signaling, which they're now looking at uh, in, in, in great detail. Now, in, con in, in conjunction with uh, Priya Rajagopalan at USC, they've also asked uh, whether or not this module-based polygenic risk score correlates with particular patterns of atrophy. And um, this is a voxel-wise plot based on uh, statistical parametric mapping, in fact, voxel-based morphometry of MRI. And you'll see that uh, people with a high polygenic risk score for this microglial uh, module, M45, have a greater degree of atrophy, gray matter loss in the entorhinal cortex uh, and the hippocampus. And much the same method applied here, you can see it with uh, the hippocampal subfields overlaid, shows a somewhat distinct pattern of atrophy uh, related to another uh, risk subtype. So this is very exciting work relating genomic subtypes potentially uh, to different signatures of decline uh, in neuroimaging data. Just to tell you a little bit more about the uh, bioinformatics, Many of these uh, pathways that have been discovered uh, in, in cell and, and module-based polygenic risk um, have associated information on uh, drugs that influence them. So uh, there are repositories of, of drug uh, action uh, on these uh, expressed genes. And so one of the major goals has been um, to identify uh, drug gene interactions that then could be used to sort and prioritize uh, approved drugs uh, for repositioning. So just to recap, 
uh, the work has been finding modules where their module-based polygenic risk lowest quart quantiles have worse prognosis. Uh, we've been seeking correlates in neuroimaging. Uh, using PageRank, uh, which is a, a module definition algorithm uh, for networks that finds key hubs in the gene expression network, and then sorting the uh, uh, drug gene interactions across multiple uh, databases uh, to identify promising uh, candidates for, for repositioning. And, and these two, uh, in particular, the anti-epilepsy drug uh, levetiracetam, um, which has been associated with improved uh, memory function in, in uh, transgenic mice, and also a, a diabetes drug, which is also uh, approved, pioglitazone, uh, which uh, ha has been shown to um, improve cognitive scores in, in, in subjects with mild to moderate AD. Uh, these have also been uh, uh, a target for uh, further verification uh, in, uh, in uh, bioinformatics databases. This is all encoded in a, in a system called Placebo. So uh, Dr. Ginga Chun at, again, at Boston University with Dwell Priyadashi and, and Nathan Sahelijo. Uh, have made a really nice interface where you could query um, new genomic hits, uh, imaging findings, or even GWAS uh, for drug interactions and perhaps uh, drug, uh, drug candidates for repositioning uh, using graph-based neural networks to pull out uh, the appropriate correlates in this multimodal data. So just to wrap up, uh, AI for AD has uh, presented the tools and methods that we've all been developing at a range of symposia and workshops and even panels uh, in the last year. Uh, notably at the AIC uh, and uh, Academy of Neurology meeting, also at the ADRC directors meetings, but also at meetings in the mathematics of AI. So there have been a number of keynotes and panels on AI, uh, both, both uh, Christos Tavatsikos, Dugo Tosan, many of the uh, site PIs have presented at leading uh, conferences in, in, in medical AI. Also at CIPAIM, the brain mapping meeting, the European uh, Biomedical Engineering Congress, and at a meeting for medical physicists, the World Medical Imaging Congress, these were all uh, symposium or keynote talks. Uh, in addition also to, to some uh, local meetings, um, we presented at the NIA Global Genomics Symposium that uh, Marilyn Miller and, and colleagues put together uh, on you know, how you could use some of these machine learning methods uh, if you're a geneticist. And it will also be the topic of next year's spy medical imaging uh, keynote lecture, which we look forward to giving. So a handful of successes so far uh, from the AI for AD project, we're, we're two years in, is uh, number one, uh, benchmarking AI and machine learning methods for a variety of AD relevant tasks, diagnosis, prognosis, subtyping and staging, based on learned patterns that can be found in biobanks of MRIs, PET, and even neuropathology. Uh, some of the hot topics include detecting uh, pathology uh, from in vivo imaging, where we saw work by Dugu Tosan and her lab looking at uh, a neuropath inferred from in vivo imaging, but also there's a very powerful use of AI for image harmonization, making scans from different sites uh, comparable, and also synthesis. We saw a remarkable example of synthesizing amyloid PET scans from, from multimodal MRI, which is really the very cutting edge of image enhancement and, and, and reconstruction using AI. Now, if you're a geneticist, you can also use all of these biomarkers as proxies in your genome-wide association or whole genome uh, studies. So some of the open questions are as follows. One of them is, can we use uh, AI methods and machine learning methods to relate the dementia subtypes that we saw stratified uh, to genetic subtypes? Now, there are two ways that we're using to do this. One is to link uh, cell-specific polygenic risk uh, to imaging phenotypes and seeing what biomarkers they, they affect. The other direction is to perform a genome-wide screen on imaging subtype dimensional scores derived from vast imaging databases. The other way to go at this is to do large-scale genomic screening of brain biomarkers. And so we talked about a study that discovered 15 different loci that affect the speed of brain aging in over 10,000 uh, people who'd been scanned twice with MRI. So that's another very novel uh, approach that pairs up imaging and genetics. And then finally, some really promising work by Junga Chun and colleagues uh, using bio bioinformatics data on druggal pathways uh, in her placebo system, also using work from the AMPAD consortium to discover drug gene interactions and potentially drug candidates that could be repurposed to influence the AD pathways that we've been discussing. So that's about it. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. Uh, and we really appreciate the funding from the NIA in supporting all these efforts that have been described uh, today. Thanks very much.